You know, I'm sure most of you do, I hope all of you <coughs> know, that meditation plays the most important part of all in our work. Even the writings and the classwork can only be of value in proportion as we meditate, as we learn how to meditate, so as to reach the depths of our inner being. In all of this world, there are very few people who do not believe in God, in some God, in God in some form, or in some manner. In all the world, there are not many people who do not pray. And in spite of all of this belief in God and all of this prayer, the world keeps on its continuous flow of good and evil, wars and intervals of peace, prosperity and intervals of lack, some little measure of health but mostly illness. There is a God, there is a deific power, there is a presence right here where we are. The entire kingdom of God is within you. This teaching is as ancient as time itself. It has always been known that there is a God. It has always been known that prayer is a means of contact with God. It has always been known that God is the activity or power, if you will use the word, of good. And yet these discords and inharmonies of human existence persist. First of all, there is a need to really know the nature of God, to know God as God really is. In Scripture it says that to know him aright is life eternal. Now just think of that statement, to know him aright. Perhaps the world hasn't known him aright. Perhaps that is the reason that sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, war, rumors of war, continue. To know him aright. Now, how do we get to know God aright? If we still are experiencing discords and inharmonies as a general rule, it might be a safe thing to say that since we do not know God aright, let us give up all of the concepts of God that we've ever entertained. Let us be courageous enough to say that perhaps we have never known God aright. Perhaps we have never been taught correctly, or perhaps we have never understood correctly what we have been taught. At least <clears throat> one thing everyone can do, if they have the necessary courage, is to start all over again and say, I do not know God aright. I do not know God as God is. Else I would be experiencing this 
life eternal. To know him aright is life eternal. Now, since we know that prayer is the means of reaching God, of contact with God, perhaps we do not know what prayer is. Or, of course, you have a concept of what prayer is, and probably in this room there are 20 or 30 or 40 different concepts of what constitutes prayer. As we go out into the world, we'll find thousands of concepts of what constitutes prayer. But can we not, as thinkers, agree that if we really understood prayer, if we really knew how to pray, that through prayer we would bring the harmony of God into our experience. And so you see that <clears throat> if we examine our religious concepts, our religious beliefs, as a rule we will come to that place where we must acknowledge I have not known God aright. I have not known how to pray. I have not known how to make contact with this infinite, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient power called God. Let us all begin with the realization that God is. Let us all begin with the realization there is a God. Let us continue from there with the understanding that since God is, God could only be as infinite being, as uh, omnipresent being, omniscient, omnipotent being, and therefore that this God that we acknowledge is here where we are. Here, where we are now, this moment. Probably that is what scripture means when it says, the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Perhaps it means that the reason the place whereon thou standest is holy ground is because God is there. Perhaps right here where I am, right here where my feet are, Right here, where I am, perhaps God is there. Perhaps that's what scripture means. The place whereon thou standest is holy ground. It isn't holy ground because you are there or because I am there. Not one in this room wants to consider himself so worthy in and of himself as to say that this uh, room is hallowed because we are here. But we can know and it probably is true that this very spot is hallowed ground because we are here. Because where we are, God is. Perhaps that is what the Master meant when he said, Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. Perhaps that's the very thing he meant, that right where I am, God is, uh, right where God is, I am, since the relationship between God and my individual being is oneness. If this were all true, if there really is a God of omnipresence, all presence, presence here and now, where I am, and where I am, that is where you are. <clears throat> if right here where thou standest is holy ground because God is there, you can then see that to bring God or the holiness or wholeness or infinite good of God into your experience, there must be an activity of consciousness take place that would bring that allness 
into visibility. Let us put it this way. Right where I am, God is. Right where I am, eternality is. Immortal life is. Immortal life, of course, means health, wholeness, completeness, perfection. Right where I am is the infinity of supply. Now supposing that I am not showing forth perfect health. Supposing I am not showing forth at this moment an infinity of wealth, of good, of integrity, loyalty, fidelity. And yet, I am the father of one, and where I am, God is. Where God is, I am. Now, we have a missing link. We have right here, where I am, the allness of God, the infinity of God, the infinity of good, the eternality of life, the infinite abundance of all being. And yet, according to appearances, I am not showing this forth. Now the missing link is that in some way or another there is either a separation between me and the God who fills my very being or else, if there isn't an actual separation, I am entertaining a sense of separation from that infinity of good. Now, of course, there can be no separation since the relationship was established in the beginning that I and the Father are one. In the beginning there was God, and then all that has appeared has come out of that godness or goodness or godhood or god being and so therefore as a matter of actual relationship the infinity of god and the infinity of all good is manifest right here as my very being so that if i am not showing it forth it isn't because it isn't here it is because i somewhere have uh, lost that sense of this infinite presence and uh, am entertaining a sense of separation. It could very well be that uh, a millionaire's child could lose their memory and uh, lose their sense of oneness with their millionaire parent and for a while no lack or limitation until that relationship were discovered and re-established. So it could be with us. We could be the prodigal son who is heir to this great father's estate and it could be that we have wandered from our father's home, that is, from the father presence or consciousness and have set up this sense of separation. It isn't a real separation because you know that the moment the prodigal turned back to his father's house in fact, while yet afar off, the father came out to meet him with the jeweled ring and the royal robe. And so it is that the son never was separate and apart from his sonship. The son never was separate and apart from being heir of that father's estate. No, no. That son merely had set up this sense of separation which kept him from it until he returned in the consciousness of his father, returned to the consciousness of the father. So with us, since in some way or other there must be in human experience a sense of separation between human beings and uh, their father, God, else there would be none of this lack or limitation, even in limited health or limited sanity or limited wealth or limited peace, there would be none of this except for this sense of separation. Is it then not possible that we do not have an actual journey to make to get back to our father's home 
we don't actually have to die in order to get to heaven we don't actually have to go to Mecca in order to find God or Rome or church but that in uh, the last analysis our return must be a return to the divine consciousness as an activity taking place within our own being remember our premise the place whereon thou standest is holy ground I and the Father are one therefore this return journey that we must take is one that must be taken right here while we're sitting in this chair it must be an activity not of the body but of the soul of consciousness it must be a return to the father's house that is taken within our own being the great master told us no more shall you pray in holy mountains not even in holy temples there in Jerusalem and one of my very favorite of favorite poems concerns a young woman who had been given the grace of the realization of God's presence a young woman of the East and uh, during a an annual trek to Mecca she made this journey with thousands of others a very difficult one over mountains rivers valleys and finally came to Mecca tired worn out but while all of the others pressed on toward the city to bend their knees and pray she was led to remain outside the city and to ponder and meditate upon this journey she had taken and then all of a sudden it came upon her the great sin that she had committed and she begged God for forgiveness that she had made this long journey hard trip to find the God who had already years ago found her in our monthly letter this very month the first article is that very subject of God seeks us because I have discovered in the many many years in which I have been going to Mecca many 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 times that arriving there availed nothing unless the journey to Mecca was made right where I am standing or sitting or having my being here and now where I am then I have found not that I was successful in finding God but rather that I was successful in letting God catch up with me yes we have that in England too the hound of heaven that great great race away from God making it so difficult for God to catch up we do that we do that when we seek God in books in teachers in teachings in churches in temples we do that we run away from God every time that we seek God outside our own being church is a rightful place so is the holy mountain and Mecca books of the right sort are also right teachers are right and teachings are right only however in so far as they lead us the student back to the kingdom of God within our own being this room this lecture fulfills its purpose only in so far as it reminds us that the kingdom of God is within our own being and must be sought there must be found there 
our classwork fulfills its mission only in so far as it reveals to us that in the deep silence within our own being God must be contacted. God is not a God afar off. God is not far off. The kingdom of God is within you. And our own poet has said, closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. And so it is that in the course of my studies, my meditations, my unfoldments and revelations, it became apparent to me that God must be found within. It must be found within my own being. And then later, that it must be found within your own being. And the question arose, how? How? Every time I close my eyes, there is a clamor. Thoughts intrude. And not always pleasant thoughts. It just seems that in shutting out the noises of the world, the noises that go on within me become uh, louder more insistent. How then, how then find uh, this inner peace? How then find this realm that has been revealed to us all through the ages? Every mystic has revealed the same truth. The kingdom of God is within you. Every great revelator has revealed that the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. But only a few have uh, been able to show us how to find God, how to bring God into our intimate and daily relationship. Now in this age of ours, there began back in the early days of Christian science and of unity a practice called mental work and another one called the silence. And the Quakers for several hundreds of years have known what they call meditation or the silence or being still within. Now, all of these teachings lead us in the right direction. Every one of them indicate that it is only in this inner stillness, in this inner silence, and it may well begin with mental work, but the mental work has to go further than mental work. It must be outgrown as mental work and uh, evolve into meditation, finally outgrow meditation and evolve into actual communion. Now there are the steps that I discovered. I found that first of all, I don't mean that I made the original discovery because I'm here with giving you due credit for the fact that it was in Christian science that I first learned of mental work. It was through the reading of Quaker literature that I learned of the silence. It was later in unity literature that I knew that they had what they call the silence and meditation. But it was through these things that I was led back to the kingdom within myself where I received the unfoldments that have since gone into the infinite way literature, writings revealing these steps that for those of us of the Occidental world who cannot, of the Western world, who cannot get silent within, who cannot fall into an immediate peace within, that there are steps leading us to it. And the first of these steps we may call mental work. That is, an activity of the human mind 
that leads us to the second step of meditation. Now, this mental work is uh, the declaration of such truths as we have learned in Scripture or in our metaphysical writings, in any of the metaphysical writings that form the basis of our understanding, a rehearsal within ourselves of certain basic truths and uh, by bringing to conscious remembrance these statements of truth, the affirmations of uh, spiritual truth and the denials of material errors or falsehoods of belief, gradually our own thought within learns to become a little more concentrated, a little less scattered, to settle down to a greater sense of peace, and then we are led to this second step, which is meditation. Now, meditation differs from mental work in that a meditation has for its activity, specific activity, the pondering of God and the things of God. Here, we leave our statements of truth. It is uh, as if no longer were we doing a mental work of our own. It is more a beholding, a pondering, a watching of, uh, let us say, the word God to begin with. And... Uh, watching as ideas of God and activities of God and thoughts of God begin to unfold within our own being. We aren't doing the thinking now. It is as if we were watching these thoughts as they appeared within us. In our classwork, we go through all of these steps so as to bring ourselves to that point where we can sit back here now and watch these thoughts appear within us as we ponder them, look at them, behold them, consider them. And from there, we go to the third step, which is a communion. And in that, the human thought itself becomes still. We don't still it. I have learned this that people who try to still the human mind end up in trouble. There is no way to stop the human mind functioning, and I would not recommend that anyone try it. But as you do this original mental work, that is, permit your thought to be active along the line of truth, it will of itself settle down to where you can begin to ponder the spiritual realities and then again it will settle down and become still quieter until all of a sudden you'll notice that it isn't functioning at all. That instead of you thinking thoughts, instead of you watching thoughts, all of a sudden you yourself become aware of an inflow from your own spirit. We call it God. It is from your own soul within your own being. You begin to understand what the psalmist meant when he said, My soul panteth after thee. There is within each of us a divine faculty. In my writings, I call it the soul faculties, spiritual faculties. They're not something that you use. They're something that really use you. They're not something that you indulge. It is really something that flows through to you. It is very much like the faculties of the artist, the writer, the composer, the painter, the sculptor. There is a faculty within them that they never use. They merely become aware of as it flows into expression. You, you just can't have a uh, composer or a 
good writer or painter sit down and say, I'm going to make up a good poem or a good painting or a good book. You just can't do that. They don't have that faculty or ability. But they can sit down in quietness and in peace. And uh, they have the faculty of being patient, of being still, of being quiet, until this flow begins from within them. And they know what it really means then when uh, a beautiful piece of work flows through them from this inner soul of their being. Well, so it is with spiritual truth and spiritual power, which is healing power. It's not only the power of the healing of the body and the healing of the mind, the healing of the pocketbook. It goes even deeper than that. At first, it is really a healing of all the difficulties of the world. They disappear from one's consciousness and uh, while you see them and read them in the newspapers or hear them on the radio, they no longer become a part of your own experience. You know they're disturbing the world, but you know that the world can stop it any time that it wants to sit down and listen to God. Metaphysics has been a tremendous blessing to the world, but to some few it has seemed to be a barrier to their finding God for the simple reason that they have misunderstood the original import of the advent of, of uh, metaphysical and spiritual teachings in the world. Many people believe, and erroneously, that metaphysics came just to heal the mind or body or pocketbook, that it was just another activity of bringing greater human uh, peace to them, or human abundance, or a human sense of health. And that was never, never, never its intent. The advent of spiritual and metaphysical teachings was to bring the kingdom of God to individual consciousness, the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. And thereby, all of these things was to be added unto us. Instead of that now, we have, unfortunately, Many have become addicted to demonstrating supply or demonstrating companionship or demonstrating health. And of course, all of this is a barrier to finding God. All of this serves as much of a barrier as if a person deliberately set out just to demonstrate a fortune, no matter how, why, or how, but demonstrate it, get it. And they do not realize that in trying to demonstrate supply and companionship and home and transportation that they are just as much interfering with the demonstration of God in their experience. They're cluttering up the whole avenue of their soul with an attempt to get things and conditions instead of to get the basis of all things and conditions and that is God itself. Now in our work, uh, we have but one goal. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of these things will be added unto you. Our work is based entirely on seeking a realization of the presence of God. Seeking a consciousness of the presence of God seeking an awareness of that which is divine. Our entire work is, oh really, it's summed up in, those master, in the Master's uh, verses there, Luke 12, 22 to 32. Not to seek for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, wherewithal you shall be clothed, but rather to seek ye the kingdom of God. Let these other things be added unto you. Our work is really based on that premise that if you can for a while forget your problems, or let us say 
that your problem is uh, too acute for you to forget it for the time being. It's either too painful or too distressful. Then have some help while you yourself give up the attempt to demonstrate harmony. Let someone else take over that for you while you give your entire attention to the seeking of the kingdom of God, the realization of God's presence, the practicing of the presence of God through mental work first, meditation next, actual communion next. Communion, that third step, is where God and I become so consciously one that we're in and out of each other like waves going in and out of each other. And uh, that leads, of course, to the fourth and final step, which is the union itself. In that union, and that is attained, of course, only by those who are far, far along on the path, in that union itself, the personal sense of selfhood disappears and God is realized as the God isn't realized at all. God is the only being there is left. And yet, one does not lose their individuality. One is not absorbed to the wiping out of individuality. But that individuality is seen, understood, felt as God being itself. We won't jump to that point this moment. Let us take the steps that come first. In our very first work, we are to forget our problems. By forget, I mean keep them out of thought. While we ponder everything that is possible for us to know or remember that we've ever learned in scripture or metaphysical writings about God, qualities of God, the facets of God, the function of God, the nature of God's creation, the nature of God's law. And as we do that, we are automatically led to that second step of meditation. And it is in this meditation that we experience our first healings. Because while absent from the body, we are, even if it's only in a measure, present with the Lord. And in that presence, we find our harmonies beginning to appear. Now, it is for this reason, just imagine, it's taken me 45 minutes to tell you why meditation is important in our work. But it's a 45 minutes well spent if it will bring home to you this, that God is in the midst of you and that the entire power of God, the entire power that can unfold and reveal harmony, peace, joy, power, safety, security, dominion, health, wholeness, holiness, completeness, all of that is within you and that you yourself must find a way to reach it. Now, there are many ways of reaching it. I, if I be lifted up, shall draw all men unto me. In proportion as any spiritual teacher is lifted up into that divine consciousness, they are enabled to draw their student up to some measure of that same spirituality, that same harmony. That's how healings take place. That is one way. The second way is with the help of a teacher and one's own effort in doing their mental work, their meditation, their communion, again rising to that state of consciousness in which the inharmonies and discords of humanhood naturally fall away. Now, all of this is accomplished by our own efforts, reading the word, hearing the word, meditating upon the word, pondering the word. You'll find this all confirmed in Scripture. There's not a word I'm saying to you that isn't in Scripture, in your own Scripture. Ponder the word. The Master says, 
abide in my word and let my word abide in you, then you will not be that withered branch. But if you do not let this word abide in you, if you do not abide in this word, you will be cut off as the withered branch. And uh, in the 91st Psalm, it reminds you that a thousand will fall at your left and 10,000 at your right. But it will not come nigh the one who dwells in this word, who lets this word dwell in them. And in old Hebrew scripture, you get the same thing. Put the word in your forehead. Bind it upon your arm. Keep it closer to you than uh, breathing. All of these things are symbols. That is why in uh, the Orthodox Hebrew homes, they have the little Ten Commandments in a, in a little uh, scroll, and they have it at the gate of their door or up at the doorway to their home. And uh, in their religious ceremonies, they have it here, they have it on their arm. Closeness of the word. And of course, the master carried that out, not in those uh, forms, because by his time they had done away with the outer forms of worship. That is, he had these outer words, and he understood that all of this keeping of the word was to be an activity of your consciousness. Now, we in this uh, age have the same idea that while it may be a fine thing for you to use whatever symbology you might enjoy, have any of the church ceremonies that you might wish, as a matter of fact, you will only come into the real awareness of this as it becomes an activity of truth in your consciousness. Now, at first, you carry this word wherever you go. You will notice in the infinite way, I think it's page 94 to 103, 95 to 103, and it begins on waking in the morning and then it shows you not a formula, but it does show you a mode of thought that if we awaken with this in the morning and while we're making our physical preparations for the day, keep within our own thought the realization of God's presence, God's activity, God's word, the power of God, the presence of God. As we leave our homes, never to go without an activity of our own consciousness reminding us that the presence goes before us to make the crooked places straight. The presence remains behind us to bless all those who pass that way. In other words, truth must be kept active in your consciousness morning, noon, and night so that eventually you fall asleep with truth active in your consciousness. And now, this too is only a phase. Because when a person has consistently and persistently done this for, oh, let us say, eight, nine months, a year, and when they have meditated three, four, five, six times a day for just periods of two or three minutes, they have so trained themselves in maintaining truth in their consciousness that a great miracle takes place. A transition takes place in their consciousness and all of a sudden instead of them having to know the truth or declare it or remember it truth begins to declare itself within them they no longer have to remember a thing no longer have to declare a thing all of a sudden truth begins to pour in and you and I begin to hear it or sense it or feel it within us we become aware of it. I've called that in the, in the uh, infinite way. That stage of our development I've called being a beholder. It is then that our mind is no longer active with truth. Truth is active in our mind. Truth itself is active. In the beginning of our healing work, our students learn how to voice truth. You'll find this, every one of the writings has a chapter on treatment. And in those chapters you will find how our students train themselves to give treatments, to know the truth, when uh, they are called upon 
for their own benefit or others for help. But as you follow us in our classwork, you will find that every student eventually comes to the place where it is no longer necessary for them to give a treatment. The student at that point receives the treatment. In other words, the student comes to a place of transition in their experience where if you ask them for help, they'll say, I will give it to you immediately. Then when they close their eyes, they adopt this listening attitude. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And Mrs. Eddy has a hymn. I will listen for thy voice. Well, Mrs. Eddy would be the last one in the world to object to our repeating that. I will listen for thy voice. Or, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And then inside here comes that welling up of the divine spirit of the presence and with it comes a healing treatment or realization that, and it is that that does the work for our patients and our students. Then we can truthfully say, I didn't do this, God did. I was the instrument through which God made this truth available. God made this healing presence available. And from that time on, you really know what the Master meant when he said, I can of my own self do nothing. It's the Father within me that doeth the works. The Father worketh, and I work hitherto. My doctrine is not mine. These words are not mine. They're his that sent me. I'm but the instrument. I'm but the instrument. I'm listening, and God, the Spirit within me, remember, God is closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. The whole kingdom of God is right within my own being. So I don't have to go anywhere to bring God to you. I merely have to create a vacuum. Just create a vacuum of my human identity, put it out of the way, and let, it be, let this be an instrument of stillness, of listening. I will listen for thy voice. Speak, Lord. I serve and hear it. And into that stillness, into that silence, pours this divine spirit, this Holy Ghost or divine comforter, and it brings a message, sometimes a scriptural passage, sometimes a metaphysical statement of truth, and sometimes nothing more or less than, than a feeling of the presence, a tingling in the fingers, sometimes a deep breath in here, but always you recognize it, you can't mistake it, You'll never have to ask anybody, was it the presence of God? When it's the presence of God, it says it to you, and it says it with a smile. A, a whole smile comes to your own face, when you, and you can feel that there when this flows in. And then, inevitably, you'll hear from your patient or your student that something has happened in their experience. Sometimes they get worse, and that's a good sign, too, because something's being knocked out of the way. It isn't always a good thing for them to feel better right away. Sometimes it isn't possible because healing isn't just a changing of physical conditions. You see, healing is a change of consciousness. And if there is some state of materialism still blocking your thought, the healing has to first come along and do away with that before it breaks through to uh, the organs and functions of the body. You see, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. This divine consciousness will raise it up again. But it has to be a divine consciousness, not a mortal one or a material one. And so it is that our work is a continuous inflow of the word of truth up until such time and you see, we have these uh, writings, we have tape recordings, we have a monthly letter, we have a daily inspiration, we have all kinds of help to keep our consciousness filled with truth until such time as we don't need any of them. Truth itself then fills our consciousness from this 
infinite well. Do you remember what the master said? If you ask me for water, I can give you water, living water that springs... Well, that's it. Once you make this transition from knowing the truth to becoming aware of, beholding the truth, then you don't need books or teachers or teachings or anything else. It is a wellspring and uh, all you have to do is just close the eyes for a blink and all of a sudden feel this welling up within you. And uh, that is where all life is transformed because from now on you have a great secret revealed to you that is found in the Master's teaching. Now you begin to understand what he meant when he said, I have meat the world knows not. I have meat. I am the bread. I am the wine. I can give you waters even without a bucket. And even though the disciples didn't go to the city to buy him meat, he still could say, I have meat. I have meat the world knows. And you will know then that you have an inner source of supply. Supply of money, supply of ideas, supply of health, supply of peace, joy, power, dominion, safety, security, the allness of good. You already have that. You already have the meat that the world knows not of, the wine and the water and the bread. You already have the power of resurrection within your own being. But you see, it doesn't come into manifestation until you make that period of transition. Many people say, well, if this is all true, and the Master did teach it, you all agree with that, why aren't we experiencing it? For this reason, you haven't yet made that transition. You haven't filled, you see these generations in which you've been separated in belief from God has made you depend on the thoughts of the human mind. You haven't been receiving your spiritual inspiration from within. Now, by filling your consciousness with truth, by filling your consciousness with truth, by keeping your consciousness filled with truth, you ultimately come to a day of transition in which the old man has died and the new man is reborn. Then, oh yes, there it is. Now you'll know what he means when he says, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not every word of truth you declare. No, 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 that's the first step. But in that last step, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that the Father pumps through us. Every word of truth that comes to us in inspiration and through inspiration. I don't think we need a class next week. Let's go home. Thank you.